Hi class, welcome to the second lesson. In this one, we will review some of the chemistry basics that you need for biology. Now, since you already covered this in your chemistry course, I'll go through it fairly quickly. So first, let's review some basics of atoms and isotopes, then electron energy levels, and finally, I will talk about the chemical bonds that hold molecules together. So an element is a substance that cannot be changed through a chemical reaction. And an atom is the smallest unit with all of the properties of an element. And here's a diagram of an atom. It is composed of the central atomic nucleus with the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons. These don't have a charge. Then this atomic nucleus is orbited by the negatively charged electrons. And then remember, most of the atom is actually empty space. Now, some elements can be found in nature in different forms or different versions. Um, and these different forms of a particular element, they're called isotopes. Now, an isotope, um, different isotopes will have the same number of protons. That's what defines them as a particular element. However, they will differ in their numbers of neutrons. Now, some isotopes are uh, called radioisotopes. These radioisotopes are unstable, meaning that they're constantly changing by giving off either energy or particles. And these are particularly useful in our study of biology. Just think about it. How do biologists and chemists study processes that are invisible to the human eye? Well, we need to use certain tools to allow us to visualize these processes. And here in this next slide, you have um, an example of a medical application of radioisotopes. And this is a PET scan of an Alzheimer's patient. So in a PET scan, um, the doctor wants to see which parts of the brain are the most active. The patient is given some radioactively tagged glucose to ingest. And then the doctor can follow where in the brain do you see the most radioactivity. Wherever you see the most radioactivity, that means um, that's where the brain is absorbing the most of the radioactive glucose. That's where the brain is the most active. Now you'll also learn about other uses of radioisotopes, such as um, using them to trace a particular reactant through a chemical reaction to see where it ends up. Now let's go back to the diagram of an atom. And this particular one is showing the carbon atom. So here's the atomic nucleus, and it is orbited by a number of negatively charged electrons. Now the electrons can be found in different orbitals around the nucleus. And why is this important? Well, each electron has a certain amount of potential energy depending on which orbital it is in. The further away it is from the nucleus, the more potential energy it has. The closer it is, the less energy it has. Now, if you hit the electron with additional energy, the electron can actually jump to a higher energy level. And then if it moves back down to the lower energy level, it will give off energy. This concept will be very important when you study cellular respiration and photosynthesis, two very important sets of chemical reactions in living organisms. So let's repeat it again. If an electron absorbs energy, it can jump to a higher energy level. And then energy is given off when the electron moves back down to a lower energy level. So now we're getting to our last section, which is about chemical bonds. So two or more atoms of either the same element or different elements can form a molecule by forming a chemical bond. So we'll review several different types of chemical bonds. The first is the covalent bond. In a covalent bond, the electrons are shared between the two atoms. So here's a carbon which has a covalent bond with hydrogen. And between them, you see a pair of electrons, one from the carbon, one from the hydrogen. And this pair is being shared. Now, this particular carbon has formed four covalent bonds with four different hydrogen atoms. 
In each case, you can see a pair of shared electrons. Now, do you remember the difference between a polar covalent bond and a nonpolar one? Let's see. So I'm going to draw a bond. So first an oxygen that's bonded to a hydrogen. Is this a polar bond or a nonpolar one? Do you remember? Well, hopefully you answered that this is a polar bond. In this case, the pair of electrons are um, found a little closer to the oxygen. They are not shared equally. Now, why is that? The reason is that the oxygen has a high electronegativity. Now, what this means is electronegativity is a measure of how strongly an atom pulls the electrons to itself, how strongly it attracts the electrons. So oxygen has a stronger pull on electrons than the hydrogen. Hence, they are found a little closer to the oxygen. They're still shared. They're just shared unequally. Now let's do an um, example of a nonpolar bond. So here's a hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen. In this case, this is nonpolar. And that's because that pair of electrons are shared equally. In this case, they're both hydrogen atoms. They have equal electronegativity. They have an equal attraction for the electrons, so the electrons are shared equally. However, I'll now give you a trickier example. I'm going to draw the molecule that was on the previous slide. Carbon bonded to four hydrogens. This happens to be called uh, methane. Now, is this molecule polar or nonpolar? Well, carbon is slightly more electronegative than the hydrogen. It does have a slightly stronger pull on the electrons. However, this is considered a nonpolar molecule. The reason is that because there are four hydrogen atoms distributed symmetrically around the carbon, all of the electron pairs are symmetrically distributed. They're evenly distributed around the central carbon. Hence, the distribution of charge is symmetrical, and this is a nonpolar molecule. And something to just remember for future reference is anytime you see molecules that have um, carbons surrounded by hydrogens, such as fats, for example, will have a lot of carb will be a chain of carbons and hydrogens. Um, they will all be nonpolar. This is opposed to, a, say, a water molecule, in which case the oxygen is bonded to two hydrogens, which are not distributed symmetrically. And the oxygen has higher electronegativity, so it's pulling the electrons closer to itself. They're not distributed symmetrically. So this is a polar molecule. And because the electrons are found a little closer to the um, oxygen, the oxygen gains a slight negative charge. It just has a little bit more negative charge closer to it. And both of the hydrogens will have a slight positive charge. The hydrogens did not lose the electrons. They're just further away, so the hydrogens are slightly positive. Now, before we talk about what an ionic bond is, let's define what an ion is. An ion is a charged atom. It is either positively charged because it has more protons than electrons, or it can be negatively charged because it has more electrons than protons. So an ionic bond is an interaction between two ions. One ion loses an electron and becomes positively charged. The other atom gains an electron and now becomes negatively charged. Positive and negative charges attract to each other, so these two now form an association because of their positive charges. This is not the same as a polar covalent bond. In a polar covalent bond, the electrons are shared, 
unequally, but they're still shared. Here, one atom lost the electron to the other atom. Now, hydrogen bonding only applies to polar molecules, such as the water molecules you see in this diagram. So a hydrogen bond is a weak association, a weak interaction between a hydrogen and an oxygen or sometimes a nitrogen that are not covalently bonded to the hydrogen. So here you can see the hydrogen on this one water molecule is forming a hydrogen bond with an oxygen of another water molecule. And the reason that they form this interaction is because of the polarity of the water molecule. So this oxygen has that slight negative charge. The hydrogen has a slight positive charge. And opposite charges attract, so these form a weak association called the hydrogen bond. Now hydrogen bonding doesn't just occur between different molecules. It can also occur within certain large molecules. Intermolecular means within a molecule. So here it's an example of a hydrogen bonding in DNA, your genetic material. So this piece is a, a close-up of this little part of the DNA. And you can see the hydrogen of the left strand is associated with the oxygen of the right strand. And again, here the hydrogen on the right is forming a hydrogen bond with the nitrogen on the left. And this holds the two strands of DNA together. Hydrogen bonding also occurs in other molecules like cellulose, which makes up plant cell walls. It is um, the part of your diet that's fiber. And all of the dashed lines here represent hydrogen bonding within cellulose that makes cellulose very rigid and gives plants their structure. Now, van der Waals interactions are very brief, very weak interactions within or between molecules. They have to do with the fact that electrons are just constantly orbiting the atomic nucleus. They're just constantly in motion. And at any moment in time, more of them might be found on one end of the molecule, making that end of the molecule temporarily negative and the opposite end temporarily positive. So this is illustrated here. So in this molecule, at one brief moment in time, this end is negative. In another molecule, because of the electrons orbiting, this end is temporarily positive. Positive and negative charges are attracted to each other, so these will form an association. In a moment, it will be gone because the electrons will move again. So van der Waals interactions are constantly forming and constantly breaking. But because there are always some there, together they're very powerful. For example, they help this gecko climb up the glass because of van der Waals interactions between the gecko's feet and the glass molecules. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So in this lesson, we reviewed four types of bonds, covalent, ionic, hydrogen bonds, and van der Waals interactions. They are critical to forming biological molecules. Now, hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions are especially important to holding the shape of the molecule. And the shape of a molecule is critical to its function. In this picture, in pink, you have a hormone, and it is binding to a receptor protein on a cell. The shape of the hormone has to exactly match the shape of the receptor. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So you will learn more about this later in the year. I hope you found this review useful and I'll see you next time.